Hello and welcome to another issue of Bagged and Boarded. I think this is issue seven. I don't know. I don't get paid to do these. Leave me alone. Today we're talking about the Dungeons and Dragons movie. I went and saw it the weekend it came out and was pleasantly surprised. I'll open with that. Pleas Overall, I thought the movie was passable. I will say I loved the first half of the movie and then I felt like it hit a point where it was going on for too long because the first half of the movie was just so strong. That whole bit with Jonathan, that shit fucking killed me. The entire thing with him being like, I'm sorry, it's just really hard for me to dive into these painful memories without Jonathan being here. The entire thing with Chris Pine trying to stretch it and him going into his tragic backstory, you can tell where the characters are making their roles and doing good roles versus bad roles. Loved seeing Icewind Dale, loved seeing that entire prison sequence, loved seeing them put their party together, it was so good. I was like into it hook, line, and sinker until they show Holga Kilgore's husband who is played by Bradley Cooper. He plays a halfling, I wanna say. Fam, that shit looked so bad. He looked like a person who had been digitally shrunk. It looked horrible. We are living in a post Lord of the Rings world. I'm sorry. And if Lord of the Rings was making convincing looking hobbits like 15 years ago, I and one of the things I like about those films is you actually see Peter Jackson talk about how he differentiated between a dwarf and a hobbit, although they were of similar size. And he goes into proportions and he talks about how he had to change the proportions of the armor and the proportions of their costumes, essentially, so that at a glance, you could really tell the difference between a dwarf and a hobbit. And he also went into how he made hobbits look like hobbits versus just looking like shrunk down humans. The CGI in what's supposed to be a really emotional scene between Holga, who is very much a full-sized human, and her ex-husband ends up just not being sold because I legitimately couldn't get into the scene. If that's passable for you, I don't know what to tell you. Like you've been watching too much MCU, but I'm because it was bad. It was really bad. And I went and looked at some of the behind the scenes stuff for how they made shit. And they actually used puppets. And so that's why the Dragonborn looks good. That's why the Tabaxi baby looks good. They had a puppet like for the Dragonkin or Dragonborn that was rigged to a mocap actor who sat and expressed. And then that was basically captured by a computer and translated into the puppet. So like, that's why that stuff looks so good. It, it was practical effects. And then you have this horrible CGI scene with the halfling and it's confusing because they did such a good job on everything else that it's just confusing. And so of course that scene stands out because when you're watching a movie where everything is practical effects and then you have this weird CGI scene, it's going to stand out. The movie gets really, really, really good pacing at one point and then kind of loses that pacing and then picks it back up again towards the end. But there were parts of it that I was like, this feels a little bit like padding. And the bits in the Underdark felt like padding. It felt like it was just put in there so that they could make reference to as many locations as they are allowed to. I would have loved if they had saved the Underdark for a sequel. I really liked Zank Yandar, the perfect paladin. Even his exit for me was written as like a perfect like DM exit where you introduce an NPC to help the players that's more powerful than them, that's better than them at everything. And then they have to come up with the fake reason why they can't help because then the, he would just fix all their problems. So I actually love that he just like walks away in a straight line. If you're looking for it, you can kind of tell what everyone's doing from the outset or what everyone's class is from the outset, but they never really spell it out. When they revealed that Simon is a 
wild magic sorcerer. I am curious how somebody who's never watched or doesn't know anything about D&D would enjoy it. For them to dive in so unabashedly right out of the gate where they're like, oh, I've heard the, the new counselor is a Aarakocra. I was like, damn, like right out of the gate, we're dropping Aarakocra and here's a dragon person and just deal with it. I kind of loved that the movie was fearless about that, which is what I actually really liked about the first Contact movie. I had never seen anything Star Trek before, and yet I watched it and I understood the plot and understood what was going on. I understood what Borg are. I understood what Data is and why Data is kind of having this identity crisis. I understood it, even though I had never seen anything Star Trek in my entire life. That's like my blueprint for like how these types of things should be done where the fans love it and people coming in, you're not talking down to them. You're not insulting their intelligence because you're understanding that, okay, they'll get it and you have faith that they'll get it and you just keep it moving. I think the movie is a good example for how to be a better player. It really reinforced my personal philosophy that buy-in is the player's job. There's like a scene where... At, Everyone's kind of giving up and going home because they're having trouble attuning with this helmet and their plan has fallen apart. And they all find a reason to come back and continue on the adventure. And I was like, yes, that's your job as a player. If you make a player that doesn't have a reason to adventure and doesn't have a reason to be with the rest of the party, then leave and make another player or don't play D&D. But it's really weird that, and I've been encountering this more and more where you have players that don't have any buy-in and make it everyone else's problem. The movie is a, actually a pretty great example of how a D&D campaign should and could run. It also, I think, is reaffirming of failure is so much more interesting than sometimes successes. Like when they go through all of this trouble to get the helmet and he can't attune with it right away, it's actually satisfying. I think like when he finally is able to attune with it, you're like so excited for him because you've gotten to see the repeated failures to get to that point. I also love how they showed the creative use and the misuse, quote unquote, of um, magical item, which is once again, another hallmark of a good campaign is a player saying, well, couldn't I put the hither thither staff on an item, smuggle the item into the vault and then use this to go through the vault? And it's like, yes, you can fucking do that, but that's not what it's for. But yes, you can fucking do it. Because once again, it's it's how your average D&D campaign goes. It's really impressive for a movie to hit on so many different elements that make for a good campaign. But regardless, like, it was just a little too long. And... I found myself looking at my watch towards the end. And if I were to get it on DVD, there's a part, there's definitely like a 15, 20 minute section I would skip. I don't know why everything has to be fucking two to three hours. <sighs> I loved the idea that these were like low level characters that were taking on a challenge that was way above them. They kind of just win and get by through good thinking and ingenuity and trying different things. And like I said, I think like the movie is a great primer for how you should play a D&D &D game. The movie embraces failure. The plot keeps moving on forward with other options in play. I thought that was really dope. I loved how the combat felt like a D&D &D combat. It happens really fast, but you see the characters go in one by one, almost like it's a turn order. It was such a small detail, but it felt really cool where they're all attacking this mage and it's like fucking 5v1 and she's still whooping their asses. People are going to walk out of this and want to play a druid. I also can't help but notice that the amount of times that they repeatedly said fresh cut grass, I cannot help but wonder if that was a critical role reference because Sam Regal plays a character named Fresh Cut Grass. The fact that they kept press the digitating the smell and they kept talking about it like because they bring it up like two or three times. I I feel like maybe it was a reference and I was like, that's cute if it is a reference. Um, if not, that's a hell of a coincidence. I also kind of liked they're all kind of at different places in their journey. You have a druid that's very good at what she does and you have a sorcerer that's 
still figuring it out, kind of bad at it. And you have a bard that's nowhere close to where the barbarian's at. Like in the time that the bard takes out one person, the barbarian takes out like eight. And the paladin was even referenced as being higher level. Everybody had different levels and everyone had different things that they were good at and that they were bad at. It kind of leans into the idea that you can have an interesting or likable or dope fucking character and not necessarily shine in combat. You don't have to be the highest level party member to tell a really good story or still be narratively compelling or even have a good time. Edgin is in some ways like the least combat capable, but in other ways is the most determined and at times the most resourceful of the party. Edgin is like the heart of the party in a lot of ways because his motivations come from a really pure place of just wanting to be with his kid and have this complete family again. He is someone who is obsessed with this idea of atoning for kind of indirectly leading to his wife being killed. And he is obsessed with this and can't move on. I thought that was actually like a really cool overarching narrative of being obsessed with the past and not being able to move into the future. Because this is something that is a recurring theme throughout the movie. You have Edgin who's obsessed with his wife that he's lost. You have Holga who's obsessed with this ex-husband that she's lost. But even before that, the reason that her marriage falls apart is because she's obsessed with being banished from her tribe for wanting to be with this man. And she can't let that go. And that's why her marriage falls apart. You have a tiefling who's kind of still holding on to this general distrust and dislike of humans based off of things that have happened in the past and is having a hard time putting that aside for what could be the future. And you have all these different characters that are holding on to different pieces of their past and they're allowing it to shape their futures perhaps a bit too much. It's this thread that kind of binds all of them. You have this like really satisfying payoff where when given the chance to resurrect his wife or Holga, you have this really heartwarming scene where he chooses Holga. You have this backdrop of a red mage plot and this like larger threat, but then you have a smaller story about this one character and their backstory finally getting like successfully resolved. And I think a lot of D&D campaigns actually fail at that. Everything is not about you. If you're not willing to go on this narrative adventure with other people at the table and allow them to explore something and not and not be able to like find investment in that, like you should play by yourself. Even though this was Edgin's backstory, we still got to learn a lot about all of the other characters and we got to have one character who like I said had this really great chapter closing on what was a traumatic event in his life if people watch this movie and then they go and they decide that they're gonna they're gonna play d and I'm happy they have this example to build their game off of um a lot of it felt like merch drops. A lot of it felt like name drops. And I'm not trying to shit on them. I'm just trying to say that like some of it felt natural to me and some of it felt like they were really just trying to hit certain points of like we need to sell this merch or we need to like sell these toys or we need to sell this video game. So we need to get these names out there. Some of it felt like they were trying to put it in on purpose. Other stuff felt super natural the gelatinous cube, the displacer beasts, the owl bear, that all to me felt super fucking natural. But, you know, my joyless nerd moment of the week. I'm going to get to that now. There has been conversation online. This is why I don't log online anymore. And so I don't stream as much as I used to because I'm so tired of the Internet. And I feel like there's just been this really shitty energy in a post OGL world of people that don't even play D and D meaning about everything that D and D does because they don't have a life. I guess they don't like, I would like to see a picture of their bank account uh, because I, I don't think there's anything good happening there, uh, which is why they have the time sit online all day. And so in this post OGL world you have a situation where 
There are people who've made their whole brands hating Dungeons and Dragons and hating everything that Wizards of the Coast does. Now, the OGL was a piece of shit, but they also walked the OGL back. And for people that are like, oh, you broke my trust and the trust has to be rebuilt. You trusted a company? There's two ways this has manifested. The unfair criticism of the D&D movie and the assertion that it's a flop, which has been very weird. Because even if it wasn't your favorite movie, it's very weird to say it's bad because I just, I understand opinions are like assholes. Uh, everyone has one and not all of you own a bidet. So many of them stink. Because some of the stuff that's come out of the Star Wars and Marvel camps is like horrible. This is what you're going to shit on? Like that's wild. And then asserting that the movie flopped when it didn't, also wild. Like it hit number one. They've left the realm of like realism and it's just become about shitting on anything that people who enjoy D&D are going to like because they have to hate D&D as a brand. And the newest head of this multi-headed pale acne live in my basement hydra is the assertion that wizards wants racial purity and no race mixing i'm not going to tell you which accounts to look at if you go and look it's there but i'm not promoting these fucking nerds they're trying to assert that the removal of half elves means that wizards of the coast does not want any race mixing and they are the grand wizards of the coast or whatever. It's wild to me that people's takeaway is that they don't want race mixing when it's actually the opposite. Instead of it being, oh, you are a half orc and this is your stats. Instead, it's, oh, you get to choose which lineage that you want which block you want mechanically, and then you can explain how it's manifested physically, which I personally think is a lot better. A lot of times you don't describe yourself as half of an ethnicity, you know? At least I don't. But to me, like, if you're Indian, if you're thisy, you're thisy. And if someone were to be like, well, my dad's white, I'd be like, right, but you're thisy. I personally... Do not sit here and check people and say, oh, you got one white parent. You're half this, you know, you're half Indian. You're not full Indian. So to me, it always felt weird to make that distinction in D&D. &D. So if you're a half orc and a half elf, you can actually describe that as something that actually fits better than what's canonically written in the book. Because maybe you are a very short half orc. Or maybe you are, because maybe you're like Holga. Maybe your mom is a giant and your dad is, a you know, a halfling. And so that half orc would look very different than someone who's half orc, half Goliath. So putting them all under one umbrella never made sense to me. People trying to say that the removal of half elves and half orcs is them trying to say race mixing is bad. This coming from a bunch of racists is wild. No part of that argument is rooted in an actual conversation of wanting to talk about these things. What it really is is like neck beardery. It's something's changing. People don't like that it's changing. And so now they've decided to make this bad faith argument by intentionally misinterpreting what was said to make it that Wizards doesn't want race mixing. I can understand maybe there's things about the movie you didn't like, but saying it's bad, saying it's shitty, insane. We're living in a Star Wars, Marvel, Disney thing where most of the big blockbusters that get churned out week after week after week are kind of the same. A lot of them are not very good. Imagine if you had that, if you kept that kind of energy towards anything else in your life. If instead of devoting all this energy to hating something, that you were going to hate it no matter what they put out, you could put energy towards washing your ass flossing, brushing your teeth, doing your laundry, vacuuming, washing the sheets on your bed. Because I know if you're tweeting that type of shit, you have not washed those sheets in a while. You could have all of this energy for all of these things and instead look at what you're using it on. Hating a brand that doesn't even know that you exist. Did Wizards pay me to watch the movie? No. I spent my own money on the ticket. 
went and saw it myself. Wizards could stop hiring me for stuff tomorrow and I have enough sources of revenue that I'd be fine. So I don't really have a dog in this fight. I can say whatever I want about them at any point in time and I have. But it's crazy to me to sit here and devote your entire brand to hating D&D when you could put that same energy into loving whatever it is you love onto the comics of the week. Now, to clarify, these are just the comics I read this week. They uh, might not have come out this week. <laughs> I checked out this book by Dark Horse and I really liked it. It's called Blue Book and the art is absolutely fucking stunning. It's all in shades of blue. And it's about a couple that's driving home from a vacation to Niagara Falls in the middle of the night. And they have an experience with a UFO. And they call the Air Force and try to report this strange occurrence that they can't even quite remember what happened. And the Air Force puts it into their blue book of incidents. And now they feel like they're trying to cover it up. If you like X-Files, if you like highly stylized comics with great pacing, check out Blue Book by Dark Horse. So beautiful. Deserves all of the praise in the world. And I also love that it's a little bit on the shorter side. I've been loving the Batman One Bad Day comics. I've absolutely adored the Penguin one, love the Mr. Freeze one. This is the Bane one, which I went into very excited and then just didn't really, it didn't really connect for me. Some of it was the art. They have a lot of panels that are legitimately this big, like, like actual size, where they have these long action sequences and flashbacks that they do like 40 on a page. You can't really tell what's happening in them. And they're like action scenes and wrestling scenes. And so I didn't understand what the logic was behind having a panel that's literally this big and trying to have me figure out what is happening in something that's that small. So that was part of why I was confused. The other part of it is that this comic is about Bane having kicked the Venom habit, essentially, or whatever it's called. I think it's called Venom. Batman has also kicked the habit because they both used to be addicted and they're working together to shut down all the remaining sort of manufacturers and purveyors of this drug. And he has this overall weird obsession with breaking Batman's back. He keeps having memories of it. He keeps having flashbacks of it. And then he talks about how basically that was the most important part of his life. And it ruined his life because he knew he would never amount to that moment again of beating Batman. And I was like, this is a weird direction to take Bane, but okay. But I'm a fucking loser now because I'll never match the moment where I broke Batman's back. And I was just like, then why are we reading your comic friend? But then he's just recreating the one fight with Batman over and over again, because there's nothing else he's done. That's like noteworthy. Once again, when it comes to gorgeous books, you can't really beat Undiscovered Country. I've been following this for about two years, maybe three. I don't know. As long as it's been running, I've been reading it every week when it comes out. Every month, I should say, when it comes out. And uh, I had fallen behind while I was traveling, and now I'm back. And uh, Undiscovered Country has taken turns and gone to places that is hard to recap on stream. But to give you an overview of it and my glowing review... Undiscovered Country is about a pandemic, and this is before, I believe, the pandemic hit, which is kind of crazy. And America walls itself off from the rest of the country and has a communications blackout, and no one can come into the country or leave. And there's this virus called the Sky Virus that's ravaging the rest of the world, and there's no cure for it. And then America invites this team of people to get a cure for the Sky Virus, and the people come into America and America has like gone fucking crazy in the years since it's sequestered itself from the rest of the world. There's this spiral 
that goes to the center of the country and every ring of the spiral as you try to trend inwards is like crazier than the next. And our characters over this long journey I've been following them on have gone from the outermost rings, which are very acid punk Mad Max into now they're finally reaching the most central core of America and learning things about it as they go, including different pasts and different futures and the very nature of America itself, if that makes sense. And it's been fascinating in places I don't even know what's happening in the comic because it gets very philosophical, gets very existential. But I still find myself reading every issue absolutely gripped. I do wish this was a trade paperback because I, I think the thing I struggle with most is recalling exact finer details of what happens in the last issue when it's a month before the next one drops. I almost recommend that you wait for the trade paperback, but it's such a cool comic and it makes me really appreciate all the weird shit that Image does. The Alien run I've been reading is kind of winding down. Steel Team Six, spoilers ahead. <sighs> They're going through it a little bit, guys. They're going through it a little bit. But one of my favorite things about this comic is while they're fighting the xenomorphs, this group of highly accomplished droids is also fighting humans. They have to come to term with themselves as well and what it means to be synthetic versus what it means to be a person. And after the last Mandalorian episode, I have to say it was refreshing to come back to a comic that at least starts to broach those subjects because essentially the thing that they're sacrificing for this thing that they're fighting for that's on the line is every single synthetic being recognized as a full-fledged citizen and that's like the reason they're t undertaking this seemingly impossible mission and yet on the other hand, you have synthetics that somewhat appreciate and notice the art and labor of humans. And then you have people that are like, no, all humans are bad. Humans are shitty. And then you start to see some of these droids begin to crack and become more human-like. In many ways, I walked away from the comic feeling like synthetics were superior to humans and I didn't think I was going to have that reaction but I did because as the droids become more human like and exhibit more human emotion the more they become flawed whereas when they're synthetics they tend to make more logical decisions instead of decisions rooted in anger and hate and judgment they tend to make better decisions and as they come to emotion and as they become more human they end up doing shittier things to each other and just shittier things in general. You also get to see this really dope fight with an alien queen. It takes so much to kill an alien queen. I'll just say that. Also seeing her rip like a droid in two, like just is also insane when you realize how strong the synthetics in this book are because a lot of them are very great. If you love sci-fi, you'll love this because it's them coming to an irradiated planet and basically all of their expectations of what they think is going to happen are subverted in every single book. They learn something new and there's a new like problem they have to deal with. I love all the stuff that Marvel's doing with the alien comics. Really like it. Really like it. All right. That's it. This has been bagged and boarded. My goal was to finish by midnight and I finished by midnight in three minutes. So I win the game and uh yeah 